Hey, welcome to Honest Q&As, where I answer questions entrepreneurs are too embarrassed to ask. Today, we're going to be doing personal branding. And for context, I am Ray Green. I'm the founder of Repeatable Revenue, which is a growth coaching and consulting business for um, service providers. And we teach you know people to build their consulting business and help service businesses like MSPs scale their sales teams. So I'm going to go through these questions just one by one here. I've got one here that says, you know, I'm too embarrassed to post anything because I won't get any likes or comments, any advice. If you are reluctant to post, stop and ask yourself, who are the five people that you are actually concerned about what they think? Because what I have found, it was, it was true for me personally. And then what I have found in working with, you know, 150 consultants and, and clients, you know, there's usually just a handful of people that you are scared of what they think. It's not necessarily getting no likes and no comments because if you got no likes and no comments, but it was in this vacuum of, you know, strangers and people you didn't really care about, you'd go, all right, whatever. But there's usually like a handful. And for me, it was prior bosses. I was hedging just a little bit, you know, I'm going to put myself out there with, with this thing, but you know, what if, you know, my former bosses who I might be able to, to create some business with or some mentors or friends, family, peers, whatever that is, is it worth these three, five, or 10 people's opinion to not be able to build the business or do the thing that I really want to do? Is their opinion really that valuable to you that you will not build the business or the lifestyle or the thing, the brand that you want to build? And, you know, that's just a, that's, that's a trade-off. That's a choice you're going to make. And, you know, if you want to block a few people, right? And then, you know, give yourself some safe space to, to put yourself out there. But um, for me personally, I wasn't going to let a handful of people get in the way of building the the business and the lifestyle that I've been able to unlock. And I'm really grateful that I did. Second question is, I suck at writing and speaking on camera. Should I do it anyway, even if it sucks? <laughs> Listen, I can relate to this. So first of all, writing, writing came really easy to me, but I understand that writing for me is like video for some people. And I would pick the thing that you you prefer to do first, right? Like if you if if you're a better writer, then start with writing, right? And stick with writing, and you know you know focus on that, and you know improve your copy, improve your writing, improve your messaging, improve the pillars, improve feedback that you're getting from you know from your audience and things like that. So like stick to the one that's easy. Like don't start with something that's going to make it like incredibly tough, like monumentally difficult to do because you just won't get in the cadence of doing it. Or you look at it and you say, you know what? I'm actually, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm great at writing and I don't feel like I'm great at video. Like I'm just not great at creating content. You know, the question is like, should you do it anyway, even if it sucks? In my view, yes, it was difficult to turn on this camera today. I am a year into this of recording videos. I still get a little bit of a, all right, this is gonna be, this is gonna be tough. Ah, do I have to do this? You know, well, maybe I shouldn't. I could probably skip this. And if I skipped it, you know, like who, who would really notice? And I could avoid it. The reason I turn it on and the reason that I do it is because I have found that the process of entrepreneurship and the process of doing some of these things is more than just creating content. It's a form of personal growth. It's a form of personal development. It's a form of pushing myself to do the things that are uncomfortable. Putting yourself in uncomfortable positions over the long haul is a way of of growing yourself as a way of growing your your mindset, becoming stronger and expanding your capabilities. And if you only stay in the space where you're really comfortable, you're not gonna grow. Like you're just gonna stay there. And you know, it may feel really comfortable and it may feel really content, but I find the satisfaction and the confidence that I get from developing new skills and doing things that are uncomfortable over the long haul has made me who I am today. So I was working with Dan Martell a while back and I told him, I said, hey, I don't like getting on camera. Um, like it's, but it's it's part of the brand that I'm building and I want to get better at it. His advice was go live on a channel 30 days in a row, unscripted. Turn live on on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever it was. Um, I actually turned it on on all channels. Um, and every day for 30 days in a row, I went live and I talked about something that I felt reasonably confident about, right? Like I talked about sales. I talked about sales management. I talked about things that were like very much in my, my zone of confidence at the end of 30 days. I'm not going to tell you like I was, I was expert. Like it wasn't like, Oh shit, I did the holy crap. Like, I'm awesome. It's like, I told you, like I'm, I was, you know, even today it was like, Hey, you know what? You got to get your, your mindset, right? I had accomplished what I set out to do and I had put myself out there and my confidence with it, like exponentially higher, right? Like I had made myself uncomfortable for 30 days in a row. It's helped kind of like pave the way for, for what we're doing today. So that would be like a piece of advice 
that I would I would use to pay it forward. You know, if you're if you're really uncomfortable with with camera or even with writing, do it for 30 days in a row. Like put yourself out there, and um, you'll be surprised at you know what 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 can happen in um, in 30 days. Do you recommend picking a platform and doubling down or starting on all of them at the same time? Absolutely, unequivocally, do not start on all of them at the same time. Like the thing is with with platforms, every single platform has its own specific algorithms and preferences and media formats and types of content that are going to work and aren't going to work. And I can tell you, I have tried dozens of times to systematize content from one channel and make it really effective on that channel and then also make it efficient to go across other channels. And what I have found is it's it's largely just a waste of time. Focus on one channel, like find the ideal channel for you where you either have an audience or your audience is most likely to be and optimize for that channel create content for that channel and then look at another channel and start figuring out how do you somewhat efficiently start to use what you're doing to make effective content on another channel. I have in multiple other people that I've worked with and some of my clients have built million dollar businesses on LinkedIn alone. You don't need to be a mega media star to have a successful business. Next question is what the hell is an engagement pod and do I need to be in one? An engagement pod is basically, you know, they come in multiple forms. Like there's some like loosely, you know, coordinated engagement pods where you have a group of people who are on a WhatsApp channel and they're sharing their posts. I'll go engage with it. And then when I put my post in, then you'll, you basically pay it back and you'll go engage with it. We've got 20 or 30 people on this channel and we're all posting our content in here. We're all engaging with it. And that triggers the algorithm to say, Hey, this is a popular piece of content because 20 or 30 people have engaged with it. So they may show that to other people. You've got these loosely held pods like that all the way up to like fully automated pods, right? Where they're using AI and you, you've got you know, bots basically running the engagement with the same premise though. If you're here to build a business, that's not going to, that's A, it's not going to help you, but it's also going to be counterproductive. Like I've had clients come in to, to our programs and to our community and they've been using pods, right? And so it looks like they're getting 100, 200, 300 likes on their LinkedIn posts. And we're looking at, they're not getting any clients. It's not getting any real reach. They're not making any real money. And I'm saying, hey, we have no idea if your messaging really works because you've never actually tested it. You've never actually iterated and tested things to see what works, what doesn't. Like every post you put up gets 300 likes because you push a button and it gets 300 likes. Well, half of the content game is like understanding what are the best messages or what are the best ways to frame your message to your ideal client? Why do I need to comment on other people's stuff on LinkedIn? It sounds incredibly dull. <laughs> this is, I get it, right? Like, I mean, for, for three years, you know, I, the way that I got my content out on LinkedIn was one working, you know, really, really diligently to dial in messaging, improve my copywriting and create content that I thought was going to be engaging. But also two, I spent a lot of time engaging with other people's content. The reason that you want to do that, especially early on is twofold. One is when you're engaging with other people's content, um, the algorithm, like which and you don't want to get into algorithm hacking or, or chasing that too much, but it is true that LinkedIn and other platforms will effectively give your content more boost and more reach if you are engaging with the community and the platform. And it's usually true of DMs too, right? So if you're engaging in your DMs and you're engaging in other people's content, the algorithm, the system, in some ways rewards you in your content for that. And so you'll get more reach. The second reason you wanna do it, especially on platforms like LinkedIn, is you wanna be really targeted right? Like with, with who you're, with who you're engaging with. But if you find the right communities and the right people to engage, it's also a great way to get your name in front of people, right? So if there are some big influencers who are also talking to your audience, they don't have to necessarily be competitors. They don't have to be a, a direct competitor. They could be somebody that sells a different type of service to your audience. But if they've built up a really big audience and then you start engaging with their content, then what you've got is, you know, every time, like for their audience, as they scroll through and look at those comments, they see you, right? And if you've optimized your LinkedIn profile, even remotely well, they see your picture, they see your headline and the chances of clicking through to look at your profile are significantly higher. So it's also just a way of putting yourself out there and giving yourself a chance to be seen by other people and increasing the surface area for some serendipitous stuff to happen. Is there a set structure for writing a LinkedIn post? No, there's really not. Um, I mean, there's some basic guidelines. Uh, I mean, what I would say is you want a really interesting hook. You know, you want something that, you know, they call them scroll stoppers, right? Like you want something as they're, they're going, as somebody is going through their feed, 
what is a hook, the first line or the first two lines that's going to make them stop, that's going to catch their attention? Can it be something that is kind of a call out or something that, you know, a pattern interrupt, you know? So if you, and I would actually recommend like go through your feed and look at the things that make you stop, right? And then start a swipe file of those. Like go, oh, that's interesting. Then, you know, you want to make some points, you know, in, in, in your, in your post. And I'm not, I'm not big on like you know, templates or, you know, making it too structured, but you do want some white space, right? Like, so you don't want big blocks of text like this. You don't want paragraphs. You want to space that out just so that the eye can skim it. Like the more white space that you have, the easier it is to read, which means the more digestible it is. And the more people are actually going to, to engage with it as of time of this recording, um, you know, this shit's always changing, but as of the time of this recording, um, LinkedIn's, you know, giving a, a lot of favor to, um, to media, like, you know, images and, and things like that. You know, if you've got some good media and you've got a good hook and you've got a good point and you space it out, I think you're going to be good. Um, what I would be cautious about is finding, you know, three or four or five templates and just using those all the time. Um, because what that, what that does is it just, it basically puts you into the mix of everybody else. And one of the things that's really important in marketing or content in general is you want to stand out. Right? Like you don't want to just blend in with everybody else. So if you see everyone using a, like the identical format, you know, take what you can, what you can from that, but don't just replicate it. Like you want to differentiate yourself in some way, shape or form. How can I grow fast in a year? Like this is, this is the question, right? Like how do we, how do we grow faster? Here's a couple of things that I would recommend. If you want to grow really quickly in, in a year is I would recommend first get really clear about who you are, who you are writing to, or who you are recording for, who you are creating content for. You don't want to serve just everybody, right? Like if you do that, you end up with really generic messaging, your, everything gets diluted. And you're also just in this space of like over competition because people are doing the same shit, you know, define your niche, define your, define your audience and your target market, do some research, you know, like actually have some conversations with them, ask them, what are the problems that they're having? How did they describe the problems that they're having? What are some of the mistakes that, that people are, are making right now that, you know, um, are, are not going to get them the results that they want. I would focus on consistency. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say, Hey, just, just, you know, volume is everything in the early stages. Um, volume can actually help you figure out what you need to say, what you need to do, how you need to position things, how you need to message things. So early on, especially volume can really help you accelerate the process. And over time, that volume, that quantity will help you identify the quality that you need. And then you can either pare down or you can scale up the quality from it in terms of brand, you know, like, don't be afraid of putting yourself out there. If you're trying to get clients, like one of the things that I see a lot of times is people are putting content, but they have no CTAs, like they have no calls to action. They are never actually, you know, um, asking people to, to do business with them. They're not reaching out to people in DMS. They're not looking at people that view your profile on LinkedIn and saying, Hey, how can I help? You know, so there's all these other things that, that you can do. And if you want to grow really quickly, you've got to be willing to, to invest the time, invest the effort, make iterations, learn from what you're doing and put yourself out there, both in terms of the brand and content and in terms of asking for sales, making calls to action and moving your business forward. So I hope this has been really helpful. Uh, I look forward to the next session on this. This is a lot of fun. Adios.